want to say hello again. Happy Sabbath to everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us on this continuation of this series. As, as I always do, I like to thank the pastor for allowing us to do this. And I also want to thank the ladies for their help. And thank you once again for coming with us to be with us today. <clears throat> What we're going to look at today is a prophecy that bursts wide, a deception that holds many in its clutches. It's amazing how the Bible gives us graphic pictures that unlocks the keys to prophetic truth. As I stated previously, when information is repeated and it's analyzed, it strongly settles in our hearts and it gives us the ability to remember those points necessary to be said whenever we're in moments to be able to share what we have learned. Amen. But first, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity that you have given us to look at this message, to understand what you want us to know for these end times. And we ask that you forgive us for our sins. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, as I usually do, I'd like to get our juices flowing by beginning with an amazing fact, if that's okay with you. When it comes to disguises, octopuses are the ultimate chameleons. Thanks to special cells that they have in their skin, they have the ability to change color and texture, assuming a thousand combinations. In the blink of an eye, they can fade into the seafloor, appearing to be just another bumpy rock if they choose to. That's amazing about octopuses. One Pacific Ocean octopus has earned its name from its incredible ability to transform its shape. The mimic octopus has been known to imitate everything from giant crabs and fish to sea snakes. One clever species will even take up residence in a vacant clamshell and use the suction cups of its tentacles to slowly open and close the shell. It will then wiggle the tip of one tentacle like a little worm to attract hungry fish and then whoosh, the octopus will jet out and seize the unsuspecting victim. Among the most flexible and versatile of all God's creatures, an octopus can squeeze into amazingly small spaces to hunt or avoid predators. They've been known to hide themselves in soda cans and aspirin bottles. This ability to fit into tight spots, it pays off when hunting as octopuses can chase small crabs, shrimp, and fish into tiny cranks, coaxing them out with their long tentacles. The Bible tells us that when Jesus' disciples asked about the signs of the end of the age. Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. Friends, that brings us to our title for today. Antichrist prophecy exposes religious hopes. Are y'all with me? Let's talk about that. What we need to do today is to recognize the truth about this thing called the World Council of Churches and the Antichrist power. The question we need to ask ourselves is what's behind the one world church movement? Amen. What's behind it? If historians were to look back on our religious period, and give it a descriptive title, they would call it the ecumenical era. Church mergers have multiplied in a surprising manner. The World Council of Churches is becoming a giant influence in the Christian, Christian world today. We have seen a lot of change in the various church organizations. Some, they even embrace teachings and practices they never would have dreamed of that take place in their denomination 50 or 60 years ago. We hear people say, well, my church is surely different than when I was a child. 
We had quite a few testimonies and sermons here recently started like that. Even Brother Ronnie today said something similar to that. When he was a child or back when, things have changed. So the mood of change is in the air, everywhere. Some Protestant leaders have actually come to the place where they seem to be embarrassed about the Reformation. And they look with favor toward unification with Rome. Some Protestant churches are celebrating the mass and have images in their sanctuaries. That's surprising, isn't it? Pope John the 23rd, he convened the Vatican Council for the purpose of opening the windows of the Roman church and encouraging dialogue with Protestants. He said, we shall array ourselves in our most beautiful apparel and stretch forth our hands to our separated brethren and invite them to return. Several new positions were taken during the Vatican Council that have produced changes in the Roman church and which makes it more appealing to Protestants today. Services in the native languages instead of Latin, congregational singing, disposal of certain patron saints, lessening the requirement of confession. That's just a few of them to begin with. But the question we need to ask is, what does this mean? All these slight changes, what does this mean? First of all, we must understand why there was a Protestant Reformation. Or else the divisions of Christianity seem to be absurd or pointless. You see, actually, the Reformation was a protest against a religious system which was prophesied almost a thousand years even before it appeared. We now turn to a prophecy found in the seventh chapter of Daniel for background information. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 states, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, you know, it's obvious that the symbols are in use here, right? You see, much of Bible prophecy has been written in symbolic language. Yet, when prophecy is properly studied, you can find the golden keys that will unlock the meanings of these symbols. Amen? Of course, we've stated that before in some of our earlier presentations. First of all, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? We read in Daniel chapter 7, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So there it is, friends. That's the golden key that unlocks the meaning of a beast in prophecy. It represents what? An earthly power or kingdom. Now, please don't think this to be strange because we do the same thing today using symbols. We got the British lion. We got the American eagle. We got the Russian bear, and then we have a few others. You see, God, what he's doing is he's simply cartooning the future rise and fall of nations by the appearance and the disappearance of various animals in prophecy. Amen? Notice Daniel 7, verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, what does the symbol of the sea or the water represent in prophecy? All right. Remember, the beasts are pictured as coming up out of the sea. Where do we find the golden key to unlock its meaning? All right. We go to the book of Revelation for the answer. Here we find the prophet John explaining a vision involving beasts or animals, and the attending angel explains. He says, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sit are peoples, multitude, nations, and tongues. Now, again, here, friends, is the golden key. Water in prophecy represents people. 
the masses from which the nations arise. Do you see how logical Bible prophecy is? It's very logical. Moving right along. Now, what does the symbol of wind mean in prophecy? Speaking of Israel, God said in Zechariah 7, 14, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations. Once again, here's the golden key. Obviously, God did not allow a tornado or a hurricane to scatter Israel, of course. It was by war. Invading nations took them away as captives in the foreign lands. So when in prophecy represents warfare, strife, and commotion. Amen? So Daniel, in his vision, he saw four great kingdoms or earthly powers arise from among the peoples of the world as a result of these wars or these conquests. He said, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, Bible prophecy is very interesting and it's very important because it outlines the role of world powers hundreds of years before they even appear on the scenes of action. That's how Bible prophecy operates. The first kingdom that Daniel saw is described. He said, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. This lion with eagle's wings represents the first world empire called what? Babylon. Babylon. Since the lion is the king of the animals and the eagle is the king of the birds, it occupied an exalted position. It was the kingdom that ruled the world when Daniel lived. Among the ancient ruins of the old Babylon, winged lions are even found on the crumbling stones. You can see it inscribed on them. Notice what Daniel saw as he watched the future unfold. He said, and suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. Friends, this bear represents the second world empire, that of what? Medo-Persia. Medo and it conquered the world under who? Cyrus the Great. Also, the bear raised itself up a little bit higher on one side, you'll notice. That indicates that the Persians would be a little bit stronger. Many history books refer to it as the Persian Empire. Continuing with Daniels, verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard. This represents the third universal empire of what? The Greeks. Now note, this leopard had four wings and four heads. The wings denote their speed of conquest with Alexander the Great because they conquered a whole bunch of territory in a very, very short amount of time. Under Alexander, the Greeks conquered the world in a comparatively short time, but he died at the height of his glory and the Grecian Empire was divided among his four leading generals represented by the four heads of the leopard beast. Now, the fourth beast that Daniel saw was a monster, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Daniel, verse 7, says, And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, ex exceedingly strong. This beast had ten horns on his head and was a fearsome-looking creature with great iron teeth and brass claws. It was exceedingly brutal and bloodthirsty. This represents the fourth great world kingdom, that of pagan Rome. All right. The Romans, what they believed firmly in was the eternity of Rome and the empire, and they could foresee no ultimate danger to their commonwealth. But the prophecy said the kingdom shall be divided. The ten horns on the fourth beast, it represents the ten national groups into which Rome was eventually divided. Next, Daniel saw something very unusual. He said in Daniel 7, 8, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, 
coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. This little horn was so powerful that it uprooted three of the original ten horns, and it grew strong and it became great. Okay? Moving right along. There was a guy by the name of Dr. Adam Clark. He was a noted Bible scholar. He says, among Protestant writers, this is considered to be who? The Pope. the Pope. Now, let us carefully analyze the activities of this little horn to see if it actually finds fulfillment in the development of the papal system. You have the papal system, which is a combination of church and state. Rome had two phases. It was pagan for 1260 prophetic days or years, and then it was papal, which is a mixture of church and state. But what, let us see if this actually is fulfilled in what we're about to see. The Protestant reformers said that this little horn represented the Antichrist of the Bible prophecy. Daniel was troubled as he recognized the major significance of the vision of, of the fourth beast. And this little horn power, you see, he said, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast and the ten horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up. Before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. You know, it's interesting to note that there were exactly 10 kingdoms as they were represented by the 10 horns. We read in Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. These nationalistic groups were all formed out of the Roman Empire by the year of 476 AD. And later they became the modern nations of Europe we have today. Here is a map showing the division of the old Roman Empire as it went down under the barbaric invasions from the north. The Alemanni became the Germans. The Franks became the French. The Burgundians became Swiss. The Suede became Portuguese. The Saxons became English. The Lombards became Italian. But what happened to the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals? They were rooted up by the little horn power. You see, these three powers were opposed to the Church of Rome. So the church enlisted the assistance of other nations and completely destroyed them through war. The Heruli were uprooted in the year 493 AD. The Vandals were annihilated by 534 AD. By the way, that's where we get the term Vandalism from, from that particular group. Because when they came through, they tore up some stuff. And the Ostrogoths destroyed, they were destroyed by the year 538 AD, which left the papacy at that time unchallenged by any civil or religious opposition at that time. In other words, they were able to move forward with their plans. Now we read in Daniel 7, 24, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Now I want you to know in the year 538 AD, the church of Rome became an unrivaled world power. A giant church state organization that ruled supreme. Also in 538 AD, Justinian passed a decree elevating the Bishop of Rome as the spiritual leader over all the other churches. So this date in history is given as the rise of the papacy. The prophecy is dramatically fulfilled. But you may say, how can we be sure this little horn represents the papacy or the antichrist of Bible prophecy? Beyond question of doubt, the Roman religious system is clearly identified in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. 
it says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Note that there are four points of positive identification in this text. Here they are outlined for our review and careful consideration. Daniel 7, 25, first point. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Second point. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Third point. Shall intend to change time and law. Fourth point. The saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now, let us consider each point one at a time. However, before we proceed, let us clarify something. We are not casting a reflection upon the dear members of the Roman faith. We're not doing that. They are not responsible for what has occurred hundreds of years in the past. They're not responsible for that. We are merely revealing history in the light of fulfilled prophecy. The prophecy refers to the papal organization as a system and not the people of that communion. Amen? Because there's some wonderful Christian, wonderful, great people in that group. So please do not feel offended or hurt in any way. Remember, this is a message from Jesus, the author and the center of all prophecy. Amen? I am only his servant, his messenger. Amen? Actually, there's many honest, sincere, God-fearing people who are members of all religious systems. Y'all agree? Yes. And proportionally, there are just as many in the Roman faith just as any other. Y'all agree? Jesus calls them what? His sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. Friends, he may be calling you through a study of this prophecy today. So let's move forward. Briefly, let us consider the four points of positive identification. Here again is point number one. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. This is one of the most outstanding characteristics of the little horn power. Now, the question is, has the papal or the Roman religious system spoken great words against the most high? Here's a statement from a Roman source concerning the papal leader. Extracts from Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. Article on the Pope. It says the Pope is as it were God on earth. Whatever the Lord God himself and the Redeemer is said to do, that his vicar does. Vicar means representative. So he's pretending to be the actual representative of Christ on earth. Friends, let me tell you something, or let me ask you something. Is this speaking great words against the Most High? I think it is. Notice as we continue from the same Roman source, he said, hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. This statement exalts him above all men and puts the papal leader in God's place. Friends, I ask you again, is this speaking great words against the Most High? I think it is. In the great encyclical letter of Pope Leo XIII, he says, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. I'm going to ask you again, is this speaking great words against the Most High? I think it is. Speaking of the leaders of the Roman religious system, Adam Clark, he said, they have assumed infallibility. Infallibility pretty much means they're never wrong. Which belong only to God. They profess to forgive sins, which belongs only to God. They profess to open and shut heaven. Which belongs only to God. They profess to be higher than all the kings of the earth which belongs only to God. 
You know, it was against these blasphemous and boastful claims that men like Martin Luther and all the other reformers protested. That's what got it started, these type of claims. The Apostle Paul, he also warned against these type of apostate religious leaders. In 2 Thessalonians, he said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Next, we're going to uh, look at point number two. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. In other words, this little horn power would persecute God's saints. Now, again, the question is, has the Roman religious system persecuted the saints of God? Yes. First, let us find out who the saints of God are. Then we can proceed to answer that question. Is that fair? Let's do that. We turn to Revelation 14, 12 for our biblical definition of a true saint. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So God's real saints are the faithful followers of Jesus who keep his commandments. Amen. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That's what he said. Now, back to our question. Has the Roman religious system persecuted the saints of God? Yes, and, then some. and then some. Has it denounced and harmed Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus enough to obey his word and not the unscriptural teachings of the Roman faith? Sad to say, the answer is yes. History affirms this has happened. A guy by the name of John Darling, a Baptist historian. He says that there has been an average of more than 40,000 religious murders for every year of the existence of popery. Friends, let me tell you something. During the Dark Ages, it is estimated that over 50 million religious martyrs died for their faith. And that's just an estimate. This was during the reign of the papal system. Christians such as the Waldenses and the Huguenots or others who were driven out into the wild places like beasts. Those who were apprehended were tortured and asked to recant their faith in the Bible. But thank God they were true to their convictions. Millions of them paid with their lives because of their faith in God. Amen. Yes. History records these terrible facts and the Roman religious system admits that they are true. They tell you it's true. Let us read from one of their own publications. They say the church has persecuted only a tyro. A tyro means a novice, someone who is not that well uh, knowledge about certain things. He says that only a tyro in church history would deny that. Of course, you know, someone who does not know the actual history of these things might deny it. They might think it sounds absurd. Point number two has been affirmed, friends. Shall persecute the saints of the Most High. We know that was done. We proceed to the identification of point number three. Shall intend to change times and law. Naturally, in keeping with the subject of our text, the times and laws referred to here are the times and the laws of the Most High God. Now, again, the question comes, has the Roman religious system attempted to change God's times and his law? Yeah. Here we investigate the greatest crime ever committed by the little horn power of Daniel 7. And we must conclude that it is truly the Antichrist power. Remember, Jesus said that not one dot of an I or cross of a T would pass from the law, but the papacy has attempted to make some changes in God's holy law. You keep saying attempted, Fred, they have made changes. Well, of course, we know in heaven they ain't changed. So the word on earth, I can say attempted. No, they changed it. But in heaven, it's the same. Yes, they have changed it. Why do you think everybody's worshiping? 
But when you get to heaven, what is it going to be? Heaven. But that's not right. what we're talking about. So, so, of course, they changed it, but yeah. it's still attempted to change. No, my point is, my point is, my point is, my point is, it ain't changed by God. Thank you, sister. No, they haven't. Right, they right. Have right. Way. Of course. But we know at the end of the day, it's still the same. Right. The papacy has attempted to make some changes in God's holy law. Of course, on earth, they have succeeded with the change thus far, as far as we see, Sister Sarita. Is that fair? Okay. <laughs> Romanists say in this decretal, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate, abrogate laws, and dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's a strong claim. But what does the record show, Sister Sarita? It was changed, wasn't it? Right? What does the record show? Yeah. About the change. It was changed. Exactly. We're on the same page. <laughs> we now turn to a Roman catechism. And we read from the section which gives instruction on God's Ten Commandment law. Baltimore Catechism, number two. The question was, what is the second commandment? Answer. The second commandment of God is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But you might say, wait a minute. According to the Bible, this is not the second commandment. That's the third commandment. We can look in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 through 6, and read the second commandment. It forbids the making of images and the bowing before them in our worship. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. You see, friends, this commandment has been removed from God's law because what it does, it strictly condemns a common practice in the Roman religious system that's being used. So they just rearrange that for their own sake. <laughs> Again, we read from the same catechism. Question, what are we commanded by the third commandment? By the third commandment, we are commanded to worship God in a special manner on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Now, friends, the third commandment is the one which they have called the second. And it tells us not to take God's name in vain. It is the fourth commandment and not the third, which tells us to worship God in a special way on a special day. You see how they rearrange things? And you can find this in their books. Let us read it directly from the Bible. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So yes, the scriptures are plain. It's the seventh day, not the first day of the week, that we are to observe as God's holy day. Amen? Why and by whom has the fourth commandment been changed? The Catholic Encyclopedia says, the church after changing the day of rest from the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. You see, the prophecy of the little horn or the Antichrist is accurately fulfilled. Accurately. Again, we quote from an official Roman source, the Catholic Mirror. It said the Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Christian Sabbath, or Sunday, is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. 
Friends, I don't know about you, but this is sufficient to prove identification. Point number three. We shall proceed to point number four. The saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Remember, time in Bible prophecy is symbolic. All right. Here we come to a most fascinating aspect, the time element of Bible prophecy. The Bible says he shall speak pompous words against the most high, shall persecute the saints of the most high, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Where do we find the golden key to unlock the meaning of time in prophecy? God says in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6, I have laid on you a day for each year. So therefore a prophetic day equals a literal year. You may ask, well, how many prophetic days are contained in a time or times in a dividing of time? The answer is a time was a Hebrew term meaning a year. Times, plural, meant two years. And dividing of time was one half of a year. And each year on their calendar contained 360 days. Time or 360 days, times plural, 720 days. And dividing of time, 180 days equal 1260 prophetic days. Now, according to the golden key found in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, this actually represents 1260 literal or calendar years. We established earlier the year 538 AD as the official beginning date for the papal system. So we add 1260 years to 538 and it brings us to 1798 AD. This is a very important date in the papal history. The papal leader was dethroned and stripped of his power exactly 1260 years after he began to rule. It's amazing to see how accurate Bible prophecy is right down to the very last detail. In 1798, Napoleon sent one of his generals to Rome. He captured the Pope and carried him away to exile. Again, fulfill, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy and right on time, this iniquitous system was terminated. So point number four has been established in identifying the little horn power. Martin Luther and other great Protestant reformers, they proclaim this little home of Daniel 7 to be the papacy or the Antichrist. Today, we see through the World Council of Churches and the influence of the Vatican Council that the Protestant and Catholic churches are coming closer and closer together. The question is, what does this mean? You must continue attending these lectures of prophecy panorama and you'll discover the answer. These ecumenical trends will have a climax in God's great timetable to Bible prophecy. And you need to understand. The apostle Peter said in second Peter verse 19 of chapter one. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The answer is yes, friends. Jesus, the bright and morning star, is coming soon. How thankful we should be for the prophecies of his word that give light in this darkened hour of earth's history. We must be prayerful and diligent in our study of God's holy word. And more than that, Obey it or apply it, as we say. We all want to be numbered among God's saints as identified in Revelation 14, 12. Who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Question is. Are you willing to accept Jesus all the way today? I'm pretty sure most of you in the room can answer yes to that question. Because if you lack faith and you ask 
it shall be given to you. Remember, Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So we must continue to come to Jesus, not only now, but always. With that said, I'm going to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful message, this wonderful time that you have given us to convene and fellowship as loving people that love one another in your house. And we ask that you forgive us for our sins, Father, and strengthen us. We thank you for Bible prophecy, and we thank you for enlightening us to prepare us. So when these things happen, it will not be a surprise. We understand what is taking place. We thank you for your son's sacrifice, and we thank you for this wonderful, great day. In Christ Jesus' name we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you for joining us, friends. We'll see you the next time.